two gunmen uh, were clearly deep inside the bar when the shooting took place. Uh, they had to have had some evidence that they were in there on them, some evidence of blood. Uh, and yet they could never find a drop of blood anywhere associated with Reuben or John. If there was no blood found on the defendants, prosecutor Vincent Hull did not hesitate to invoke the blood-stained clothes of the victims in an emotional appeal to the jury. When you saw the bloody clothes, all you could think of, I would imagine, would be uh, maybe some retribution for, the, for these individuals who had uh, been murdered. And the verdict was, we the jury, find the defendants, Ruben Carter and John Artis guilty and my, my heart sunk you know my breath felt like the breath went out of my body my knees buckled all of it hurts i'm not numbed out that i don't feel i remember carter's first wife screaming loudly and for at least two minutes no it was a scream that i've never heard before or since a scream of such agony that jury of all white folks, if they thought for a moment that John Artis and I would have murdered those people, they would have burned our asses to a bacon rind. Unfortunately for uh, those people who feel there was a, a matter of reasonable doubt, they weren't at the trial. The state showed through circumstantial evidence the likelihood that Carter and Artis did commit as charged when the jurors were leaving, one of the women jurors was crying, and as she came out of the jury box, she turned to one of the other jurors, and she said, I feel so sorry for him, and she pointed at me. But then she turned, and her whole demeanor changed. She says, but I feel nothing for him, as she pointed to Reuben. Trenton State Prison is the front door to the insane asylum. Some prisons in this country, as we know, they're, they're just glorified holiday inns, but this is a big league prison. It was a place that smelt terribly of human misery and waste. As soon as Reuben got to prison, he, he decided that he was not going to let the prison treat him as if he were guilty. And that began with his refusal to, to put on the prison stripes. I'm looking at him like, oh my God. And you know, they, they're calling other assistants in there and I'm watching now what happens in prison when someone becomes defiant or oppositional. You tell me where to go and I'll go. But don't ever put your hands on me because if you put your hands on me, you're gonna have to kill me immediately because if you don't, I'm going to kill you. They had Reuben sent to the hall uh, for discipline. I sat in prison in solitary confinement, eating hate like it was a sucking the morsel of butter steak. In December of 1971, three months after inmates and guards died in a riot at Attica State Prison in upstate New York, prisoner unrest boiled over at Rahway State Prison, where Carter and Artis had been transferred. It came about in part because uh, there was a, a man there named Clay Thomas who took the stage during a film. He takes a chair and he throws it through the screen. At that point, Ruben tried to engage him. Well, what's the matter? What's your problem? You want to fight or something? Come on up on the stage and fight me. And Clay was saying, nope, I'm not going to fight you, Ruben. You know, I'm tired of this. I'm ready to die. I said, I will not go along with this. And anybody who doesn't go along with this, I'm leaving this auditorium. Come go with me. So half of the people left, half stayed. The superintendent came up, uh, Vuksovich, who wasn't well liked because he had made a lot of derogatory remarks about prisoners. And from out of nowhere, a guy dove across the crowd and stabbed him. And from there, a pandemonium broke out. We were being held ho hostage, but some of the men wanted to, you know, finish us off right then and there, I guess you could say. What's happened here today should come as a surprise to no one. 
particularly since Attica, prison officials across the country have been warning of impending rebellions within their institution. It could have went either way, but fortunately, Governor Cahill, uh, to his credit, used a lot of restraint to keep it from an Attica. There was hope uh, that if we did delay, that we might be able to bring reason to the prisoners. Hurricane Carter became probably, from what I've talked to guards and prisoners, the most charismatic uh, prisoner that ever lived. When you're in prison, it is like the ultimate timeout. Eventually, a person who has some goal in mind will sit down and exercise. The only thing that he really can exercise in there is his mind. And Reuben did that. I started studying the law. I was determined that our case, that our stories be heard. I was going to write my autobiography, the 16th round. Reuben had never written so much as an English term paper. He had, he finished his formal education when he was in eighth grade. It took me all of about three or four years. I thought parts of it were almost like the autobiography of Malcolm X. It was a mishmash, as, as Reuben is a mishmash of, of the real and the fake and the good and the bad, as we all are. Everybody ought to read this book. It's by a guy who barely had an education. It's a, it's a miracle of literacy. It's powerful. It's got cadence, it's strong, it's got a message. It's a well-done book. So well done that the message reached Fred Hogan, an investigator with the Public Defender's Office who knew Carter during his boxing years and believed him to be innocent. I said to him, you know, the only way you're gonna get out of here is through the system, whether it's anger or fear or hate, let's put it all together in getting out through the system. As Hogan quietly began investigating the case, he also brought it to the attention of investigative reporter Selwyn Rabb of the New York Times. In the summer of uh, 73, I read the trial transcript, and one thing jumped out at me uh, uh, specifically, and this concerned the two main witnesses against Carter and against your own artist, that was Bellow and Bradley. I knew that these two guys were the weak links in this chain. And I realized that eventually, when the cops no longer benefit them, that they're going to switch up on the cops too. And so Hogan spent several years reading the testimony, trying to track these guys down, and finally getting them to acknowledge that indeed they had lied in, in the first trial. When I had everything um, uh, from uh, Bellow and Bradley, I decided I had to see the Lieutenant Vincent de Simone, who was the head detective in the investigation. And uh, I told him, look, we've looked into the case. We think uh, there's a story here. We're going to write a story. He got up and he said, I've got a bad heart. And he put his hand on his pistol that was in his belt. And he said, if something happens to me, I'm not going alone. It was Bellow's testimony that had been the most damaging since he claimed to be the closest to the murderers as they fled. I told them it may be and it may not be. There's a possibility. But, but at the They were telling me it was, it was, it is them. I suspect and have right, right along that he changed his testimony for one reason, out of fear that he would end up in state prison with Carter and or some of his friends and that he would either be beaten or possibly killed because of his testimony. The recantations led to everything that has happened ever since. Despite not being convinced that the Bellow and Bradley recants were enough new evidence to reopen the case, Fred Hogan and Jack Newton, Carter's lawyer at the time, went to file motion papers. Their timing couldn't have been better. We're walking in the courthouse, and a guy comes up, I think he was a private investigator, New Jack. And a guy said, is he all right to talk in front of him? I said, sure, this, this guy's all right. He said, don't mention my name, but the prosecutor's office is listening to a tape that was not given to the defense team in the first case. And Noonan looks at me and says, what tape's that, Hogan? I said, there is no tape. There was no tape. He said, are you sure? I said, Noonan, there was no tape in 66. On the tape, Lieutenant Simone could be heard promising leniency to Bellow in return for his cooperation in the investigation of the triple murders for which Carter and Artis had been convicted. In the first trial, they never told the defense about the deals they made with Bellow and Bradley. Now there was not only a ring of truth, but there was some substance to it. The first article I wrote about the Carter-Artis case was in September of 
1974, and the Times uh, put it on page one. This case suddenly became one of the major core celebs. Ali led a march to the state capitol just a few weeks after the thriller in Manila. They had a couple thousand people there. His daughter is getting big, and she's looking fine, too. And the daughter, I'm going to be the stepdaddy until he gets out. He consistently offered of himself his support for Rubin, emotionally and spiritually. He'd write notes to Rubin. When Muhammad decided to join the fray, never one time did that man waver in doing anything that, that I suggested him do? Yeah, Bob Dylan writes an eight-minute song about your case. Uh, it's better than a brief to the Supreme Court. Dylan, who had read Carter's book, wanted to meet him. Reuben had never heard Dylan's songs before, but he, he read some of his lyrics to prepare for the meeting. And Dylan goes there, and the two men formed an immediate bond. Both were performers. Both were also reclusive and rather shy. We talked for eight, nine hours about all kinds of things. I mean, uh, Dylan and I were very much in tune with one another. About a week later, he showed up again. Uh, telling me that he wanted me to listen to this demo, that he wrote this song. I didn't know he was going to write a song. Here comes the story of Eric The man the authorities came to play For something that he never done Put in a prison cell But one time he could have been The champion of the world In December of 1975, Dylan's Night of the Hurricane concert rallied public support behind Carter. Three months later, the New Jersey Supreme Court overturned the murder convictions of Carter and Artis, opening the way for a second trial. Under fire from the pro-Carter stories in the press, the Passaic County prosecutor proposed a deal. Burl Ives Humphrey did offer Rubin's lawyers the opportunity to take a, another lie detector exam, and if they passed the exam, Humphreys promised that they would not be tried a second time. Why, after 1976, when the New Jersey State Supreme Court said that our convictions was nullified based upon hidden evidence, why would we believe or trust the prosecutor's office in anything they say. When they decided to try for a second time, I was confident. We're going to get you this time. You know, you won the first round, but you're not going to win this one. Optimism increased when New York attorneys Louis Steele and Myron Beldock joined the cause pro bono. Understandably, they were not welcomed with open arms by many in the white establishment of Patterson. The atmosphere was deadly. And the hostility, you could feel it as you walked down the hallways, as you walked up to the court, as you came any place near it. And we were the enemy. They resent that at such a level that you can engage that resentment by saying, look, you're getting pushed around by a bunch of rich people from Manhattan. Nelson Algren, the novelist, was uh, hired by Esquire magazine to do a story about the Reuben Carter case. And he moved to Patterson. Uh, when people found out what he was looking into, they ran him out of town. I mean, this is a very famous and successful novelist and a tough guy. At the start of the new trial, Bello dropped a bomb. He returned to his original testimony, placing Carter and Artis at the crime scene. And the prosecution introduced a new motive of racial revenge for the killing of a black man earlier on the same night. As if that would cause blacks in general, blacks in Patterson in general, and Reuben Carter and John Artis to go out and kill white people.